Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, the, um, basically, basically, the paper is based on a presentation I gave at Alta a couple, I guess a month ago. And it, is, it was done during the, uh, the lithium session. So it is quite heavily leaned on lithium in terms of metallurgical testing. But uh, this applies to any type of commodity. Um, the, the, the importance of metallurgical testing is important regardless of what commodity that you're, that you're, uh, that you're evaluating. Uh, if you want a successful project, you must uh, perform metallurgical testing. And that's, I hope, the lesson and the conclusion that you will come to uh, at the end of the presentation. So, um, again, this is a little bit of a spiel about who SGS is. SGS uh, is a, a leading uh, inspection certification and testing company uh, around the world. It's a global company. Uh, with a division that's the minerals division, that's the division that I'm in, and within Australia, the, uh, the head office is in Perth, and the metallurgical uh, lab that we have where we do the piloting is in Perth uh, as well. We do also have chemical and, uh, and analytical uh, testing facilities a little bit uh, it's dispersed around uh, Australia and on mine sites within uh, the east coast would be West Wylong, New South, New South Wales, and Townsville in, in Queensland. But we also run uh, the on-site labs for a lot of the operations. Um, again, this is just going to go through a little bit in terms of what we actually perform at the uh, lab in, 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 in Perth. Uh, just to be clear, we also have labs in, in Chile and uh, in, uh, in Canada as well, uh, which is the Lake Lab. So uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, batch uh, and batch scale testing that includes uh, uh, middle processing, hydromet, and a little bit of pyromet. We're, the pyromet side would not be the strongest. Hydromet is what we're really known for, and of course the, the mineral processing. And then we have also the continuous piloting uh, uh, facilities for a whole bunch of uh, different processes, and that includes all of the mineral processing depreciations, some pyrometallurgy, and of course what we are really known for, which is the high pressure acid leaching or uh, pressure oxidation. Uh, all the pressure vessels in terms of uh, metallurgical testing. And you have to excuse me because I, I have a little bit of a uh, sore at the tip of my tongue and it looks like I'm slurring my words a little bit, so uh, just bear with me sometimes. I just I take a little break because my tongue hurts a little bit. <coughs> so, uh, I'm going to the outline what we're going to be talking about is, what, again, this is within the framework of a, the development of a project. So, we're going to talk about the project development stages. Um, and then why the stages uh, are set in place in terms of the project development and the whole point is to uh, minimize risk. And then after that, we're going to talk about um, the type of testing that's required at each stage. You know, we don't need to do full piloting at the early stages, you know, in the scoping all the way to feasibility. There is appropriate testing that's done at uh, every stage. And we're going to go through um, what consider the normal type, or in, well, indicative type of testing, we'll explain for each type of phase. It doesn't mean that it's uh, set in stone and that you absolutely have to do that, but it's an, it gives you an idea as to the scale of work, the objective of each stage, and how the testing uh, fits into that um, objective. And then after that, we're going to go through uh, a few case studies, and again, as I mentioned before, the case studies are based on lithium. Uh, there's going to be three case studies. Uh, I think there's um, two PFS pre-feasibility studies and one DFS in detail feasibility study. And there's uh, different objectives and how we how we went about doing that and how it answered certain questions. Um, first of all, we have to determine uh, how the a project is developed. What is the stages? Uh, by which you need to develop a, 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 a project in order to be able to answer certain questions as you move along the, the progression of the, of the project. And uh, I'm using the, uh, the OSI and Cost Estimation Handbook as the framework for project development. There are equivalent uh, project development uh, framework. Uh, there's the FEL123, the front end loading systems. There's the Worley Parsons. Uh, it's called the evaluate the, the fine stage. And there's a, 
there's a multiple one. Now, I'm not saying that this is the direct one, but this is the framework we're going to be using uh, now. And this is typically the framework that is used by a lot of the junior miners uh, or ASX listed companies as the framework for uh, the progression of a project and to try to have a common definition or common basis on which we actually talk about when we're talking about uh, scoping, pre-feasibility, and detailed feasibility studies. So, um, so um, we're going to be uh, focusing on uh, just the study aspect of things. So these, these first three, uh, the project execution and, and commitment, uh, that, is a, that is at a later stage. There is metallurgical testing at these phases. See, that's uh, either optimizations, uh, uh, clarification of specific questions. But for this talk, we're going to be focused on these three uh, stages. Each stage of, a, of, a pro of, a, of the project development seeks to answer one question. And it's always, how much is going to cost? Is there a financial uh, case to be made for the project going ahead? And at each stage, what we're trying to do is narrow down the uncertainty, uh, narrow down the, um, the unknown so that we can get a better understanding of what the project is going to cost. And when I say uh, how much is going to cost, a lot, a lot of times these are done by engineers. The engineers, all they want to know, and what's the most important thing for them, is the uh, capital cost. So when you say plus or minus, let's say, Minus, plus or minus 30 to 35 percent. The uh, that on an engineer's perspective, that's a capital cost. How much is going to cost to build the plant? What's the cost of the infrastructure, the equipment? But within the project development, we also got to remember that it's the viability of the entire project, and that includes OPEX, payback, uh, 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 yearly operating uh, and maintenance costs. Everything has to be included in that. And part of the of these. Uh, the objectives of each of these stages has to answer that as well. And that's where metallurgical testing comes into play as well. Uh, and we'll go a little bit more detail as we're going along, but metallurgical testing will also tell you how much reagent, what kind of recoveries, what is the grade, what's the cost, and then any unknowns that are identified during the operation of, you know, during the testing and piloting, and saying, uh, uh, does the vessel wear out? Does, do the impellers last? Uh, is there any issues with calcining? Very equipment based information that will feed into the economic justification of our project. So, first phase is the scoping study. And that, it, it seeks to answer the question of what could it be? So a geologist goes out, finds something of interest uh, out somewhere in Western Australia, digs it up, thinks that there's some value in that, and he wants to know what could this be? So at this stage of the game, we don't know uh, what the final product is. We have no idea uh, what, uh, what the processing uh, steps could be. All we know is that we find something of interest and we need to figure out what it could, what, what it could be. So at this stage, the type of testing that we typically do are chemical analysis, uh, possibly some mineralogy to have a look at what the potential elements are, so that you could then start to identify a list of uh, of potential projects what, uh, in terms of uh, is it a gold plant, is it a gold copper plant, is it a, you know, in terms of battery metals, are we looking at lithium carbonate or lithium uh, hydroxide or lithium chloride? What are the different possibilities? And this is what uh, this, uh, this stage seems to answer. Once you've identified what it could be, then you go into the pre-feasibility studies and it seeks to answer what should it be. So at this stage, you've identified in the scoping study that it could be all these things. In the pre-feasibility studies, you then evaluate all the most uh, promising options. You do, uh, you look at three or four options. You think that these are the ones that you uh, that show the most promise in the scoping study. In the pre in the uh, in the pre-feasibility study, the PFS. You evaluate those three or four to try to identify the, the most promising, the ones that provide the, the, uh, the, the, the highest recoveries, the most uh, marketable product, the, most, uh, uh, the highest margins and the lowest cost of production. So that's what it seeks to, uh, to answer. 
then after that, you go into the detail, detail of this study. Right? And then now that we've answered what it could be, then we have to answer the next question is, what will it be? So this is where you identify exactly what the flow sheet is, uh, what is the sizing of the different vessels, uh, um, what are the, the key challenges that you may face in the testing that you need to be, uh, that you need to be, to have done. Uh, this is where uh, you pad up and you minimize again all the uncertainties. You identify what needs to be evaluated in terms of uh, potential issues with equipment. The, uh, vet vendors are starting to come in and participate so in, in order to assure that the, uh, that the equipment works well, that, you know, filters don't blind, uh, that the crushing is done as per uh, the original testing so that they can give you performance guarantees. Things are starting to get nailed down at this at this stage, and we get a very good idea of what the plant looks like. At the, at the end of a DFS, you have a layout, a process flow diagram, OPEX, CAPEX, that are, I wouldn't say perfect, but honed into a certain level where you, you have a certain level of confidence in it in order to be able to get financing. Because in the end, the purpose of all these studies, project development, and the reason why you want to go through all this is to minimize risk to the lowest possible for somebody you know for somebody to, to be able to invest in your project. Maybe either investors, private equity, banks, or the board within your own cash flow. You want to make sure that all the answers that you may have, all the questions that you may have are answered, that the uncertainties have been uh, identified and eliminated to the best possible uh, of your ability in order to be able to uh, have somebody say, yep, you should go ahead with this project. So, you know, we, we talk about the fact that, um, you know, we've gone through all these stages, we're trying to answer as many of the questions uh, uh, that we have in the project as we go along in order to minimize risk and uncertainties, because as you move ahead in the project, from scope to PFS to DFS, things get more and more difficult to change. At the scoping study, early on, everything's on paper, all the different options could be evaluated. You haven't invested in a lot of engineering time or uh, testing money, money in, uh, that you spent in testing or, or civil works or any of that. So the capital investment is quite low. So any changes in the flow sheet uh, or possible uh, processing route is all on paper. So the cost of doing these changes are low. And the earlier you are in the project. So as you can see here, in the scoping study, the cost of change is quite low because everything's on paper. You can invest in very little. And the ability of change is very high. You could change completely. You could go from producing gold to getting all that gold because the grade is too low to producing copper. It doesn't matter. The ability to change is high, cost is low, but as you progress in the project development, the cost of changes gets higher and higher. This is where you've invested engineering, you've invested in testing, you've, you've, uh, you've involved vendors, you've, uh, you've drilled holes into the ground, you've done a whole bunch of things that then uh, create a problem for you to change as you go along because the ability to change drops, and if you do want to do perform these changes, it's going to cost a lot of money. Basically, you're going back in terms of project development. So, uh, you know, there's always a mix of, I've worked on both the uh, engineering side and on the operations and metallurgical side of things. And as a process guy, I like to do it differently. I like changes. I like coming up with ideas. I like brainstorming and trying to figure out different ways of processing. But then when I get into the engineering side and I, I start talking to vendors and getting pricing and writing specs, I started realizing that you can't just change on a whim. And I have a battle in me that uh, I'm aware of because I've worked on both sides, but a lot of these processing guys don't see. Uh, it is very difficult to change as it go along. And it's, 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 it's the inherent in the way project development occurs within engineering. You try to define as much as possible up front so that you minimize risk later on. You know, there's a, a different way of developing projects in, uh, in IT. There's the agile way, which is 
continuous small improvements as you go along. You, you reiterate over and over again on a project, you change, you, you release a version quickly, down and dirty, and then if it doesn't work, you change and you move along. In a capital intensive industry like mining and metallurgy and process engineering, you can't do that. You have to work up front in order to be able to clearly define what needs to be done before moving forward. And that creates a situation where cost of change does increase as you move forward. It does get cemented. It becomes very difficult to change. And that is why the work that you do up front becomes incredibly important. And this is where I'll relate everything back to metallurgical testing. Because that will determine, uh, that, will, that will answer a lot of the unknowns. It will de determine sizes of vessels. It will you know, identify issues with impurities uh, uh, in terms of manpower. If, it, if vessels become uh, clogged or, or dirty quickly and there's build up internally, you got to think about you know, shutdowns and, and cleaning them out. This happens early with metallurgical testing and it answers so that you then move on with a minimum amount of uncertainty and risk moving forward. So, you know, I'm not sure if, this was relatively new to me, this McNulty curve. Um, I know there's, this is quite well known, especially in the nickel, uh, in the nickel uh, smelting world. These are, um, in, in the, this is a hypothetical one, but in essence it's kind of follows these type of curves. This talks about the fact that from the moment startup occurs for the completion of the plant until full uh, throughput uh, at name plane. So by the time the plant starts until it reaches its uh, defined productivity, takes longer if uh, okay, there's three types of, of projects, and we'll call them type one, two, four, and the more uncertain a project is, the longer it takes to reach an The name is 100%. So some of them never reach it. So the characteristic of each one of these projects is that number, you want to be number one. Number one is proven technologies, testing done on, on your particular ore uh, in order to be able to identify anything that's specific to your ore, vendors that have done it, the operator or the owner of the projects have operating experience, Everything is on your side when it comes to project development. You have an experience team, you've done testing, the vendors know, uh, um, <clears throat> know how the products behave within, the, uh, in, within their equipment. Uh, you have a support system, an ecosystem of vendors, uh, consultants, and engineers that have done this before. So this, this occurs in, in the type one. So if you reach nameplate, the quickest out of all everybody else. But then as you go down in terms of the different types, these are then as you as you go down and it becomes the, the uncertainties are higher. So the uh, the processing technology is unproven. It's a novel way of doing things. Vendors have never uh, vendors of equipment have never done something either as big, as complex, or the technology itself is novel. It's never been done. The uh, the project promoter is not an experienced not operator. It's uh, uh, somebody who was in the wood business decided to uh, to start up a nickel smelter with no operating people. The engineering firm that they uh, engaged to do the work have never uh, done such a plan. These are all the uncertainties that build upon one another. And then, and then as you as as you plot along the uncertainty. The time to reach nameplate increases. And why do we care about time to reach nameplate? Well, it, again, it's uh, opportunity cost. You've lost, you'll never catch up on lost productivity. If it takes you five years to reach a uh, nameplate relative or compared to one year, those four years of subpar or uh, below uh, nameplate uh, production, the revenues from that will never catch up, you'll never get it back. And then that could make, if you've decided to move on a project uh, with a, uh, a, a ramp up of two years, but it took you five years, uh, if you have known that, you probably would not have invested in it. So it becomes a non-viable uh, project. So the importance of, and I'm not saying it's only metallurgical testing that, that 
in terms of if I want to pack four, but metallurgical testing is a huge factor in terms of trying to bring you up in terms of the, the, the type of project on the economic curve. <clears throat> okay, and then where can we do metallurgical testing? Where should we do metallurgical testing? Which processes? And again, because I mentioned before that the uh, uh, that this is a lithium uh, based talk because the original talk was done at a lithium session. Uh, I've chosen the process flow diagram for lithium hydroxide. So uh, there, are, there are multiple uh, unit process steps, and again, this is from the mining, the initiation, the, uh, the initiation and the combination, and then you're going up more on time in terms of the pyrometallurgical and hydromet beginning, and then after that, we have all the, uh, the purification stage, which is a, more of a chemical conversion aspect. And then where do you do metallurgical testing? At every single step. There are no steps that you know with 100% certainty how it's going to behave. Uh, there are impurities that are, are, are specific to that ore body. There are uh, issues with a specific uh, scale of the size that you want to reach. There is uh, site conditions that will have an impact on it. Uh, there is a site water. Uh, each site has its own water. Water plays a huge role in hydromet. Its own impurities will have an impact on, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the purification stage. So we do biological testing with water that comes from the proposed site so that we know how it's going to behave. So what I'm saying is uh, every single step has to be tested, but not at, I'm not saying at every single stage, but uh, by the time you reach the DFS stage, you need to have answered everything. So when it comes to uh, what kind of testing at which phase, uh, and again, yeah, this is indicative. I'm not saying this is a hard and fast rule that you know we at SGS give you a questionnaire and you just tick off and this is what we do. There is a certain amount of um, discretion that is performed by the process consultant or the engineering firm or the metallurgist as to what needs to be done, but these are typical. So in the scoping study, yeah, it seeks to answer what could it be. So uh, you know, this is where you figure out okay, what's the mineral, what does it look like. You may do a little bit of uh, work indexes, uh, maybe a little bit of batch location, very small scale bench, but the most important thing is at this stage is to identify the impurities and identify any other valuable metals that could be monetized and used as credit for the project. So we're trying to answer what could it be. On the PFS stage, we've advanced a little bit. Yeah, the question that needs to be answered is what should it be? So this is where you're evaluating multiple uh, multiple options. What, you know, what could it be? So we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, are, we, are we looking at location? And if, if so, uh, what does the, what could, what are the two or three options that we should be looking at in terms of scavenger buffers and uh, uh, configuration uh, and what kind of reagents should we use? So this is very preliminary, but we're getting closer to trying to answer the question of what could it be? So because at the end of the feasibility study, you're going to make a recommendation as to what it should be and what are the uh, challenges that needs to be answered in the following stage, the DFS stage. At the DFS stage, this is where things get a little bit more serious. This is where you're then talking to uh, vendors. So you get vendor test work done. Um, a lot of times, uh, in order for a vendor to provide a performance guarantee uh, on a piece of equipment, they need to be involved at the testing uh, phase so they can test their equipment with the product that's going to be uh, produced, which is produced at the lab at the time learning stage, so that they could see how their equipment uh, behaves and get assurances from their side that it's going to work and then they could offer their performance guarantees. Uh, then after, again, we're doing a little bit bigger scale things, uh, more analytical things. So if you're doing uh, gas and roasting, we're doing off-gas management. So we're looking at the gas photography to see what it is. How big should the scrubber be? What are the, uh, you know, what's the size of the duct? So these are the things that you need to answer at this stage because the, 
if you remember correctly, the question that needs to be answered at the BFS is, what will it be? So this is where you're trying to really uh, explain or at least define equipment sizes, the different challenges, uh, get the vendors in there in order to be able to participate for the performance guarantees. And one of the most important aspects is the piloting. This is a, an extended period of continuous work of a, with a cycle or you know, with a recirculating loop to see if there's any uh, accumulations of impurities, where there's, you know, if there's any issues uh, uh, with uh, you know, build up and accretions, uh, how do you bleed the impurities. This is where uh, a lot of the work is done in order to be able to nail down the PFD. So then you can start working on the PNIDs and the, uh, you know, the more detailed work so that it could then inform the major equipment list, then which informs the different packages, which then informs the costing for each one of them. So the DFS that you met up with is incredibly important. And this is what it, 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 it tries to uh, answer. So <clears throat> now we have a certain idea of, of um, of what metallurgical testing, the objective of metallurgical testing is at each phase. I'm just going to go through three case studies. Um, again, very specific to lithium. Um, and uh, again, just to give you an idea of what we're trying to answer. So this first one is uh, in DFS. Again, this is at the, at the last stage where we're trying to answer what will it be. So and this is a, it's a piloting campaign. We've done uh, runs for several days in order to be able to uh, get an idea of the way it performs. It's OPEX, it's operating costs in terms of reagent use, uh, water usage, the discharge of water. So, uh, uh, so this is specifically for the, uh, this was a, uh, a spot drinking concentrate. So we're trying to produce the highest uh, uh, grade of lithium oxide, or lithia, uh, uh, that we identified something on a bench scale earlier on. We then use those process parameters on a, um, on a piloting and a index scale. So we've then been able to prove that we can get the desired grade, at the desired uh, recovery rate, and then uh, and that it's a good enough quality to be able to be used downstream. So again, we, this is a concentrator, so basically it is just a comminution and then beneficiation stage, where at, at the end we want a product of the proper recovery, at proper recovery, at the proper grade, with the purity that's that's uh, that's acceptable for further downstream processing, and that's what was proven at this stage on a recirculating load, large volumes at the testing uh, scale, at the testing scale in the uh, The second one is the PFS. The PFS again, just to remind, it's to determine what could it be. So this is where we evaluated several options. Uh, the first uh, stage was a cider test to confirm key process parameters, uh, the, the different stages. Remember, uh, I showed you the PFD of the, uh, of the lithium hydroxide. So uh, the first step, we tested at small scale every major step. So the calcination, the sulfation loads, the water leach, and then the purity removals in order to be able to uh, get uh, uh, lithium hydroxide at the uh, purity that's, that's been that's uh, desired by the, by the client so that it could go on and commercialize it. So everything was done on a bench scale, uh, trying to identify what the issues are and uh, identify what it could be and then that flows through as uh, the basis for the following stage. So uh, in terms of what we've done, again, this is just some pictures to show you the scale of things. So this is relatively small, bench scale. Um, these are just examples of the uh, of, the, uh, of the roasting at two different temperatures, uh, of the uh, in order to get the alpha to beta uh, conversion. This is the, the water leach scale again. This is like on a gallon scale, a four liter scale. This is small, but it allows us to quickly evaluate multiple options quickly with a minimum amount of cost and able to uh, trying to answer the question of what it could be. Uh, then after the following steps are the crystallization of lithium hydroxide. And so instead of having large vats and large crystallizers, everything is done on a smaller scale. Um, so you can see this is the lithium hydroxide, but it was done in a, in a glove box because uh, we needed to be under uh, a controlled environment in order to prevent 
the adsorption of CO2 on the top side. So everything is done in a control atmosphere, but you could just see the scale of things. And everything is on a small scale to quickly run through different process parameters and different options. Then this is a, uh, a another project. This is a DFS uh, for the production of lithium carbonate. Uh, there, there are two major uh, lithium uh, chemicals that are commercial at the moment for the battery business. It's uh, lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate. And we've done both. Lithium carbonate is the, the one that's traditional, but uh, in terms of the batteries, and as time moves along, it's more and more on the lithium hydroxide. But uh, this one is uh, um, for the production of lithium carbonate from brine. Uh, in order to be able to, uh, to, to do the, uh, the work quickly, we made our own synthetic brine. So instead of getting brine uh, from the lakes or the sailors in South America, uh, we knew what the chemical composition was, so we made our own so that we could make it so that we could identify uh, what processes identify what the issues are, and then after that, compare that to the actual uh, brine from the sailor so that we could see if it behaves differently. If it does, then there's some uh, composi compositionally, there's something different in the, in the natural brine relative to the synthetic brine, and then it identifies problems quickly. This is a um, you know, PFS stage, quickly answers some questions, what could it be? So again, these are three quick uh, case studies in lithium. Uh, we've done things for gold, nickel, uh, zinc, and now vanadium is a big thing, and graphite. This should be done for every project. Um, a lot of people think that uh, certain metals are you know, proven technologies. The flow sheet is, is clear. Um, yeah. The testing may not be required at every single step, but you still need testing. Uh, you know, people talk about gold being something that's you know, relatively, if it comes from the same ore body, that it's, it should behave in a certain way. It doesn't. Performing metal testing looks expensive upfront when you look at the, uh, the project development cost. Uh, the uh, feasibility study, the DFS typically costs about quarter to half a percent of the entire project once it's installed. So if it's a billion dollar project, uh, half a percent is $10 million. Uh, uh, no, yeah, $5 million. So between two and a half to $5 million for, a, a, um, uh, for the, the study itself, metal triple testing within that would cost maybe uh, half a million to a million dollars. It looks like a lot of money. But it's so much better to spend that money at this stage than trying to fix problems once the plant is built. Or if nameplate capacity is only reached four years later, that opportunity cost is gone. Uh, or you know, you're talking about plants that uh, never made it to a full ramp up. Uh, you know, the nickel plants in, in Australia are ones that are, are, are symbols of uh, incomplete studies, incomplete testing that uh, shows that if you just put half a million dollars more up front, it could save you billions later down the line. So I just want to make sure that that when we develop projects, and when we work with engineers, or when we work with clients, the junior miners are, are key, is to say that military testing is not a nice to have, it is a must have. We need to do this. It is a small investment when you think about the overall project in order to assure that you minimize the risk further down the line. So I hope uh, we, uh, we reach that same conclusion that metallurgical testing is absolutely required. And I know a lot of you in the room are metallurgical engineers um, and are in agreement with all this. And this is what you do and this is what we want to answer. But a lot, a lot of people within our industry just want to move forward, either by hubris, by excitement, by enthusiasm. But at the same time, let's not forget that we need to answer these things. Thank you very much.